We begin the program tonight with some breaking numbers out of the federal election campaign. Election Canada, Elections Canada rather, is reporting Canadians came out in record numbers for advance polls. Over the course of four days between Friday and yesterday, 4.7 million Canadians cast their ballots. That a, that's a 29% jump from the 2015 advance polls. The only difference is that this year, of course, those polls were open 12 hours a day from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. In 2015, they were open 8 hours from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. In these final few days, meanwhile, of campaigning, questions about minority governments are coming at the party leaders fast and furious. Why? Because just as we approach the finish line, the stakes appear to have changed. The Liberals and Conservatives are still the front runners in this race, but not by enough to form a majority, meaning other parties could play a major role in the makeup of the next parliament. Shachi Curl is the executive director of the Angus Reid Institute. She joins us from Vancouver. And right beside me, CBC's polls analyst, Eric Grenier. Hi, everyone. Hello. Nice to see you. Hi, Vashi. Hey, why, don't, why, don't, why don't I start off just by asking about those advanced poll numbers we had been talking about the first two days yesterday Eric I'll begin with you and how it's difficult to know what to read into them it's great to see that people came out to vote in advanced polls but that could be for a host of different reasons including the fact that there were extended hours this time yeah there was more time to vote so might have given more people an opportunity to vote but even if we take into account the extra hours it does suggest that at least turnout is similar to what it was in the last election we shouldn't take it as necessarily showing that we should expect uh, the same 68 percent that voted in the last election or that it'll be higher, uh, but certainly in an election campaign that has been criticized as being very negative and at times kind of dull, uh, the fact that we still have uh, advanced turnout being robust, potentially bigger than last time in terms of, of it's certainly bigger in terms of the number of people, but uh, bigger uh, in, when you take into account um, the extra time. At least it suggests that people are pretty engaged in this campaign. Yeah, to reiterate for our viewers, 4.7 million Canadians voted over four days of advance polls and taken as a whole, that's, 29, that's a 29% increase over 2015, though the hours were longer. Do you read anything into that, Shachi? Not yet. I think Eric makes really good points about it. Indicates that people are availing themselves of the extended hours, but not necessarily, I think, enough time for us to really gauge whether or not uh, we're seeing an overall increase in voter participation or whether this is simply the cohort of keeners who just really want to <laughs> cast their ballot. And in, in many cases, you have these folks, and they are very glad to not have to line up for, for uh, long periods of time. I mean, remember when we used to have very narrow advance polls hours and so election day became for many an exercise in frustration especially if they needed to get to work or to school or do other things uh, I think Elections Canada with each passing election is trying to do as much as it can to open up that opportunity for Canadians to vote so if anything again these are the people who are super duper excited about voting but we don't know if it actually represents a bump just yet let's talk about people perhaps who are still making up their mind Eric go over if you could for us what the national picture looks looks like according to the poll tracker. Well, we're still seeing a really close race between uh, the Liberals and the Conservatives, the two parties well below anywhere they would need to be to get a majority government. Uh, we currently have them at 32% for the Conservatives, 31 for the Liberals. I know Shachi just came out with some new numbers, not included in these yet, so they'll obviously move around once that happens. Uh, but the NDP is going up. They're now at about 17. And in terms of where that would come out in seats, it is just as close in terms of who would win uh, the most seats with these kinds of numbers, with uh, both the Liberals and the Conservatives potentially below 100 140 seats, and the New Democrats and the Bloc Québécois potentially above 30 seats. And that starts getting, you know, people need to bring out their calculators to figure out if anyone can Good get to Good thing you it. have one. I do have a calculator. It's a very <laughs> old one. Uh, but it can still handle these numbers. But uh, in terms of whether any party or group of parties can get to 170, that might even be challenging for any two parties, unless we see some change between now and Election Day. Shachi, how does that compare to the numbers? In the, and I know you just have some ones just out as well. That you're uh, very is. consistent. So look, uh, this has been the case of uh, uh, a story of frustration for the two leading parties that started out with a pretty uh, they, they were head-to-head -head and, and deadlocked themselves at the beginning of the campaign, so there they were battling for supremacy. But to have a third party come up and really, uh, uh, you know, uh, get within uh, 12, 13 points of uh, both the Conservatives and the Liberals uh, has to be one that absolutely drives both Andrew Scheer and Justin Trudeau crazy. So we're talking already a lot of permutations around minority governments and what would that look like and would the parties have a coalition. Look, right now, I think what we have 
to understand is where and how the dynamics are changing. In British Columbia, the campaign started with the Liberals uh, in it, it chasing the Conservatives, but, but in a very competitive space. They've now slipped down and are actually tied with the NDP, which is surging for its traditional second place. So it's given up gains to the NDP in British Columbia. The party, the Liberal Party, has also given up big gains to the Bloc Québécois in Quebec. And of course, Quebec was the only safe battleground for the Liberals a month ago, no longer the case. At the same time, Andrew Scheer is seeing his party's numbers dip as well. And so again, uh, the, the path to majority for either of these parties, I think now, hey, anything could happen in seven days, but as of today, looks effectively blocked. Uh, and so that certainly amps up the level of machination in terms of what the parties are considering. But one really important thing to consider is the certainty of the vote. And you've heard me talk about this a lot over the last few weeks. Uh, that certainty is still really, really mushy within the NDP base and within the Green base, and to a lesser extent, within the Liberal base itself. So more than half of indicators NDP and Green voters still say they're not certain about that vote. The question becomes now at this late stage, do they actually change their vote or do they stay home? And so I think that's the thing to be watching for. Are these people going to simply self-select out of the process or will they show up? And if they show up, will they stick with the party they've chosen? Eric, we had been talking in the previous five days or so about the, the, the NDP's momentum and what it, what it eventually means. Uh, Shachi obviously shows what it means in BC and mm -hmm. in other provinces. I'm interested in the, the vote efficiency because now you're showing a projection of a, you know what looks like an increase in seats. What's behind that? Yeah, well, for the New Democrats, we have seen them tick up uh, pretty much across the country. And in some places, for like example, in Quebec, they're not anywhere close to where they were in 2015. But now maybe they actually can win some seats in Quebec and no longer uh, a given that uh, every single single seat in Quebec is going to be uh, on the bubble for them. In Ontario, we've seen that their numbers are starting to get pretty good, and in some cases we've seen some polling with them above 20% in Ontario. We have them just below that in our averages, but that starts to open up a lot of seats for the New Democrats in uh, downtown Toronto, in northern Ontario. We, at the beginning of the campaign, were talking about whether the New Democrats would be able to hold on to some of the seats they held in southwestern Ontario. It doesn't seem to be like it'll be that big of a problem anymore for them to hold the seats that they won in, in 2015 and maybe win back some of the seats that they lost in that election, the ones that they had won in 2011 under Jack Layton. So for them, it's getting a lot better. Uh, Shashi mentioned in BC how their numbers are really starting to look uh, much, uh, much more improved. Now they're vying with the Liberals and the Conservatives for that top spot in the province, depending on the poll. Uh, if the New Democrats can hold this support straight through to Election Day, and that's the big question, they could end up uh, maybe losing seats in Quebec, but actually having a net gain in the rest of the country, where they come out ahead of where they were last time. We've been touching Shachi throughout the campaign on sort of key battleground areas, BC, Ontario, and prim primarily, I guess you could argue, Ontario and Quebec. Given what we have just described, what both of you have just described, where specifically do you imagine this plays out uh, over the next six days? Like, wh where are you zoning in on? Well, obviously, all eyes continue to be on the two battlegrounds I mentioned, but especially on Ontario. The most seats, very vote-rich in terms of opportunities for all three parties, and the most deadlocked in terms of the actual fight, again, not just between the Liberals and the NDP, but the ability for any, uh, sorry, the Liberals and the Conservatives, but for any party to really pick up some momentum and break the logjam. So the story of this week in terms of numbers and vote intention is very much a story of morass and deadlock and the question is do we stay in this sort of blocked up place for the next seven days or do we start to see uh, some movement particularly again this, this campaign started with the story of the left of center and where it would finally land does it end with the left of center starting to to move in one direction or another in a way and we've seen some moves for the NDP but really move in a way that will help us understand where and how this campaign is going or frankly is this shades of as I remember British Columbia 2017 where the numbers really just sort of locked in and then we did see uh, the votes really fall out in in terms of a, of a 
very even distribution in terms of seats in the House. Always important to remember that popular vote isn't the same as seat projection. Obviously, there's a lot of seat modeling that people like Eric do, but we cannot take uh, perfect popular vote numbers and simply apply them to distribution in the House. It has a lot to do with incumbency, and we're going to see, especially for the Liberals and for the NDP, how much incumbency makes a difference, i.e., I like my MP, I'm really mad at Justin Trudeau, what am I going to do about it? Am I going to stick with the person who helped me out on a matter locally in my constituency, or am I going to kick that bum out because I'm mad at the bum in Ottawa? Those are going to be the questions for voters as we get closer to E-Day. A quick final question for you, Eric. Is there a challenge at all for polls in capturing what is kind of a late stage momentum for especially the NDP, but arguably even the bloc? Like, is it hard to measure the sort of possibilities that Shachi goes over, given that we are so close to Election Day? Yeah, I think so. We saw that in 2015, uh, the polls that were there up to the end, that were polling straight up into Sunday, and the vote was on Monday, uh, like it was, like it's going to be this time, those polls showed that the Liberals were getting much closer to that majority mark or had them above the threshold. Those polls who were out of the field a few days earlier, they missed some of that last little bit of momentum because it was happening in those last few days. It wasn't, it wasn't that the polls were missing it out. So in this case, if the New Democrats are still crowded that they're still uh, having some momentum near the end of the week, the pollsters that are going to be staying in the field straight up until Sunday night probably will have a much better chance of being able to capture it, capture it because often a lot of this kind of stuff, when it has the bandwagon effect mm -hmm. in the last few days of a campaign, it can be pretty dramatic. And that could be one of the things that happens if we find out that in the end the results are different from the polls. It could be that a lot of these people in the last uh, little bit of the campaign, that's when they made up their final decision. Okay, I'll leave it or there. Or if they stayed home. Exactly. If they stay at home. No, no, yeah. very important thing to pay attention to. Thank you very much to both of you. We will be checking in often, I'm sure, right before and right up until Election Day. Thanks to Shachi Curl of the Angus Reid Institute and, of course, CBC Polls Analyst Eric Grenier. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.